Um, we're here to celebrate uh, the, you know, the fifth anniversary of, of uh, Huygens' um, descent on Titan at the end of a long journey, a billion miles in, in all. Um, but uh, the, the project has really been a, a journey of another sort for, for many of us. Uh, for, it's occupied us for uh, much of our careers, in fact, my entire um, career. Um, and uh, that, that spans, spans uh, 20, 20 years or so. Um, this is a, a picture from the um, uh, experiment preliminary design review, um, the, the sort of first, uh, first major grilling of the uh, surface science package experiment in, in Oxford in the UK. Um, uh, you uh, heard from Jean-Pierre uh, Le Breton earlier. Uh, Hawkins Fedem is involved. Uh, he's now the project scientist of Venus Express. Uh, Don McCoy, who was sort of my mentor at the time, uh, is now the project manager for ExoMars. Uh, Michel Verdon uh, was my boss at the time, and uh, soon to become my PhD advisor is John Zanecki, uh, who's uh, in the audience right here. Uh, he must have enjoyed his experience at uh, the Kozner's house here near Oxford because uh, I understand he actually got married there um, just a few weeks ago. Um, I had the, uh, the honor, uh, the privilege to uh, be involved in the construction of SSP and to, to work on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, this uh, instrument, the penetrometer. Um, so that was, uh, that was set me up for my, my PhD, but in fact, uh, I, can, I can trace my education a little bit further back. And in fact, it begins um, about uh, two miles away. Um, I actually went to uh, kindergarten at the uh, Colegio Santa Cristina uh, here in Tibidabo, in fact. And so uh, I was three years old at the time. Uh, my Spanish was as good as my English. That's uh, unfortunately no longer the case. Um, I had uh, regular vocabulary, um, but was good at games. Um, I was attentive and, and uh, understood. Uh, I was only, only regular at eating. Uh, I can report happily that I've uh, addressed that uh, issue. Um, <laughs> Uh, in fact, I, I wasn't alone. I have a twin sister, uh, Kirsty here, um, who's an artist in, in Scotland. Um, coming back to, to Titan, um, Titan and Saturn go around uh, the sun in uh, just under 30 Earth years. It's a kind of interesting time scale because it basically means that a, a human being um, gets to live for about two and a half uh, Titan years. And uh, you can sort of map out a human lifespan to two Titan seasons. Um, we are uh, up here just after northern spring equinox, uh, more or less the season that uh, Voyager 1 flew by in 1980. So in uh, 1972, uh, I was back here in, uh, in Barcelona uh, near winter solstice uh, or, or southern summer solstice equivalently. Uh, you know, I grew up, went to, went to high school, grammar school actually, William Shakespeare's school. Uh, I learned, learned engineering and uh, joined ESA and uh, that's where I was then. Um, uh, a few years later, I got my PhD. I went to Arizona um, and uh, met a uh, graduate student there. And uh, uh, you heard from her, in fact, uh, uh, earlier today, uh, Doctor, now Dr. Elizabeth Turtle. And uh, Cassini was launched a couple of years thereafter. Uh, we uh, flew to, to Titan, arrived up here in 2004. And uh, there's the, uh, the Huygens encounter. Uh, the celebratory uh, bottle of uh, whiskey is in the foreground. Uh, John Zarnecki won, won that bottle with the uh, 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 guess at the descent time of 88,069 seconds. Um, and uh, we uh, come back uh, to Barcelona um, last night. I had the opportunity to look through uh, the telescope with which uh, uh, Comasola discovered Titan's atmosphere. Um, so let's look at, uh, at that, uh, that, that landmark event. Um, Comasolo was probably the, the most active uh, Spanish astronomer in the first part of the century. He established uh, the observatory here and it has a, an unusual binocular telescope. Uh, you have two barrels, 38 centimeters in diameter, one you look through and one you can use for photographic plates. Uh, so it's, it's little bigger than a, a regular amateur telescope of, of the, the modern era. Um, but uh, it really is astounding just how good an observer uh, Comas Sola was. He had uh, exceptionally good eyesight. Uh, in fact, with a, a, a telescope and the naked eye, because the, because the eye processes images so quickly, it can actually do very well at seeing small details. Um, Titan, even though it's the, uh, just the second largest uh, satellite in the solar system, because it's so far away, it's very, very small, just uh, one arc second in diameter. So it's about the smallest object that can be resolved um, with a, a telescope uh, looking through the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, as you've uh, uh, maybe already heard, 
um, Komisola reported that he saw limb darkening on Titan, that uh, in this sketch here, the, the edge of Titan's disk uh, is darkened, and he correctly interpreted that um, to be like how Neptune appeared uh, through the telescope and that, that it indicated a, uh, an atmosphere. Now, I haven't been able to understand quite why he drew two bright patches. Uh, I actually looked at the ephemeris just to make sure there wasn't a, a shadow of the ring there. It's possible that he's seeing evidence of a cloud. It's possible that this is just so close to the threshold of observability that he was fooled into, into thinking there were two bright regions. But the, the, the main aspect of, of his discovery uh, is that, uh, is that he, he recorded correctly uh, limb darkening and interpreted it correctly. Now, science is, is based on reproducibility. So if you're the, you know, the guy with the best eyesight in the world and no one else can see what you've seen, is that really you know, the discovery? Um, but it's, it's interesting in that context to look at what else Coma Solar did uh, in addition to discovering comets and so on. Um, he ob observed or reported that Io looked, uh, Jupiter's moon Io looked flattened. Uh, and in fact, it, it is um, tidally um, massaged by, by Jupiter, and that's what causes the volcanism. And Komisola thought that uh, Jupiter's gravity was actually stretching it. Uh, in fact, it does stretch it, but only by a very, very tiny amount. There's no way he could have seen that stretching. Um, but in fact, the polar regions of Io are, are darker in color than the equatorial region. So looking through a telescope, it would indeed look flattened. Um, he drew uh, this sketch of Ganymede, and you can compare uh, this sketch with uh, images from the Galileo mission, and they compare quite well. So he's really seeing details uh, on an object that's, uh, that's two arc seconds across, as seen from the Earth. Uh, he also, um, at the time, um, uh, noted that, that he saw no canals on Mars. Uh, at the time, Lowell in the States was uh, advocating that Mars was a you know, habited, habited world um, and uh, had uh, canals on its surface, but uh, Komisola could, could tell that they, they weren't there. So comparing these, these other observations that he made, he, he really did see what he reported, that uh, there's limb darkening, but it's an extremely challenging observation to do. Uh, the, uh, the, the more conventional, reproducible, if you like, discovery of Titan's atmosphere owes itself to, uh, to Kuiper and uh, this photographic spectrum where you see these dark areas corresponding to the absorption lines of, uh, of uh, methane. Um, as you can tell, uh, over the 20 years of my involvement in this transatlantic project, um, my um, uh, uh, idioms and language have, have hopped across the pond, so sometimes I, I say methane, sometimes methane. I uh, hope you can keep up. Um, here is another representation of the, um, the, the spectrum of Titan, so the reflectivity versus wavelength. This laser pointer is here at about 673, so these dips in the brightness are those methane bands that, uh, that you just saw. And these bands get stronger as you go into the near-infrared, but the, the haze gets more transparent. And you can take, <clears throat> as, a, as an amateur, this, this talk is notionally about small telescopes, uh, uh, as an amateur astronomer, and I've, I've even done this myself with a, uh, an eight-inch telescope and a, a small CCD, uh, you can make Titan spectra in, in just over a minute, actually. And uh, these, these spectra, there's one here in white um, made by a, a, a Japanese amateur astronomer uh, with a, a spectrometer that he built, built himself, in fact. Um, uh, it matches very well with the uh, uh, professional spectra recorded in the, uh, the 90s and the, and the 80s, and you see very well the, the methane bands. So you yourself can uh, reproduce with, with amateur equipment, maybe a $1,000 worth of uh, equipment. Uh, you can reproduce this discovery of, of Titan's atmosphere. Um, and in fact, uh, um, I've encouraged the, that amateur, uh, Mitsuga Fuji, uh, to keep doing this work because the spectrum uh, changes with the seasons. Um, and so he's been observing since 2001, and you can see that uh, while parts of the spectrum match up very well, other parts are evolving. Um, Titan is getting darker um, in the, 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 the blue. Um, it depends how you normalize it. But. Uh, another area that uh, amateurs can contribute with, with small telescopes is occultations. Uh, when a Titan goes in front of a star, as seen from the Earth, the star's light is refracted by the atmosphere, uh, and that um, the amount by which uh, the uh, light drops and the timing of the drop um, can give us uh, information on the, the structure of the atmosphere, the, the haze layers and, uh, and uh, temperature perturbations in the atmosphere caused by gravity waves. 
Uh, and you can see here uh, this example uh, from an occultation over uh, Southern Africa, uh, South Africa and, and Namibia, uh, just a few years ago. Um, these uh, spikes here are evidence of gravity waves in the atmosphere. So you have the, the, the star plus Titan light here, uh, star plus Titan after the event, and only Titan in the middle. Uh, and just how the light falls off depends on Titan's atmosphere. You can also see this spike in the center where Titan's atmosphere is basically acting as a lens to bend the light around Titan's body uh, and, and sort of shine through in a way. Uh, the big strength of this kind of observation is when even with the small telescopes, you take several of them and arrange them in a sort of fence so that Titan's shadow or the equivalently the occultation track uh, uh, goes across the fence and in, in effect the, the different telescopes make different cords across Titan and you can see a, a set of these observations and then they have different uh, central flash um, structures which um, let us um, determine some, some really quite fine structure in Titan's atmosphere. Um, these events will reoccur from time to time and, and amateur astronomers can make a, a really valuable contribution here. Uh, small telescopes um, are also useful for monitoring seasonal change in a uh, photometric sense, just looking at the disintegrated brightness of Titan. And um, at Lowell Observatory, uh, even though they were sort of founded on the, you know, the premise of looking for canals on, on, on Mars, they continue, continue to do very valuable work. Uh, and uh, back when I was in Barcelona in 1972, they began a program to uh, monitor a number of stars uh, and the planets. Um, Neptune, Uranus, and, and Titan. And they noticed that uh, uh, Titan's darkness, uh, brightness varied over several years, and they attributed this to um, solar activity, the solar cycle, um, because the uh, ultraviolet flux from, from the sun is responsible for uh, creating uh, at least part of the haze. Um, we saw with Voyager that uh, the haze structure is different in the north and south hemispheres, and as we see different parts of Titan as the seasonal cycle progresses, uh, Titan's um, brightness is modulated, so it, it goes up and down in a, a half yearly or 14 Earth yearly cycle. Um, we have seen that in action with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, at blue wavelengths um, uh, half a Titan year ago now. Uh, the uh, northern hemisphere was brighter than the south. Uh, the opposite is now the, now the case, uh, and we think it's atmospheric circulation that's uh, pushing the haze around and causing these changes. Um, now, Wes Lockwood, who, who began that program at Lowell, or was involved very early in that program at Lowell, has um, diligently continued. I mean, this is, this is the planetary equivalent of Keeling's monitoring of uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide on the Earth. This is, you know, thankless work. Uh, year after year, you patiently uh, record your observations. You make sure the calibration of the instrument is good from one year to the next. And you can see this nice uh, 29 and a half year double cycle. But you see that as the cycle uh, repeats in terms of its season, uh, Titan is different. So the seasons do not repeat perfectly. Uh, there's some sort of interannual variability, perhaps due to the solar cycle, perhaps due to some memory in the Titan system, perhaps it's lakes or perhaps the amount of haze. Uh, but it's only by this kind of patient uh, long-term monitoring with a small telescope, with just a 21-inch telescope, telescope um, that this kind of interannual variability can be um, detected. Uh, in fact, Titan, uh, as we see it now, is darker than it's ever been observed to be. Uh, and there's no reason amateurs can't uh, make observations exactly like this. Um, clouds have appeared from time to time on Titan. Uh, this is a Hubble image in um, 95. This is a Keck image in, in the near infrared, rather better one. Um, uh, but you can see that clouds uh, affect the total brightness of Titan. And in fact, uh, it's possible to uh, measure the presence of clouds in, in favorable circumstances um, with uh, amateur telescopes. Um, this is a graduate student, uh, Antonin Boucher at Caltech. Uh, he used a 14-inch telescope uh, with a set of uh, filters and a CCD. And by ratioing the filters, you can get the light curve of Titan. This is Titan's brightness versus uh, orbital phase, so over the 16-day uh, Titan uh, orbit. Uh, you see the, the bright leading edge. This is you know, Xanadu. Um, and big deviations from this ratio might indicate the presence of clouds. And uh, other students, uh, Emily Schaller, who's now no longer a student, she got a PhD, uh, uh, among others, uh, have used a small telescope, initially this 14-inch 
um, Celestron at, uh, at Caltech, more recently a, a remotely controlled telescope in, uh, in New Mexico, um, they've used it to trigger, you know, they, they know from this small telescope that some cloud activity is occurring on Titan and so have, a, if you like, a good reason to ask uh, big telescopes like the Keck or Gemini um, to make uh, uh, more detailed observations. Uh, so I'm coming uh, close to the end, uh, returning to imaging. Um, this is a, a Hubble uh, image uh, taken earlier this year. Um, Titan is uh, on, on Saturn's disk. Uh, you might be able to see that it's more orange and that the, the uh, north is darker than the, the south, as was uh, uh, the opposite of the case um, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, you can get quite comparable images with uh, webcams and small telescopes now. Um, just like the naked eye, because a webcam can take a very short exposure image, it freezes the shimmering in the atmosphere. And in fact, uh, you can build up adequate signal to noise by taking um, literally hundreds or even thousands of very short exposure images and picking the best 1% or 10% of them and stacking them up. Uh, and uh, the results uh, uh, you know, give, give you um, quite detailed structure of uh, Saturn's cloud belts. Um, this is uh, work by uh, Antonio La Sala, uh, an amateur in, in Spain. Uh, you can see, see Titan as a little dot over here. I mean, Titan is just barely resolved. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, a Dutch amateur, actually, Arno van Kronenberg, uh, who went to Hawaii for the ring plane crossing in, uh, in February. Uh, his weather, unfortunately, wasn't great, but you might be able to just see on this projector uh, the shadow of Titan cast onto Saturn's disk, uh, and there is the Titan's disk just there. Uh, he, was, he was a little unlucky with the weather. Um, this is uh, another uh, amateur, uh, another Spanish amateur, Jaime Castella. Uh, his uh, observatory is actually only seven kilometers from here, um, but he's taken some nice uh, three-color images, again showing the nice banded structure uh, of Saturn. Uh, he, he's also had uh, great success looking at, at Mars. I mean, this is the sort of image where, if you imagine, uh, this is what Coma Sola might have seen uh, with a more or less equivalent telescope a century before, and he's not seeing canals here. Uh, this picture of the moon, I mean, this is, you know, this is a good enough image of uh, the Copernicus crater to actually do geology on. You know, it's not just a, a little dot. The, the best uh, telescopic images we had of Titan with the Keck, with Hubble, um, taken before Cassini arrived, where it showed about as much detail on Titan as you can see on the moon with the naked eye. Um, but here with uh, amateur uh, telescopes, you can, you can see the moon well enough to, to actually look at geological structures. So the, the last image here uh, is uh, another by Jaime Costella uh, of uh, Jupiter. And you can see uh, the Galilean satellites. You can see that they're disks. You can see details on them, just like uh, Coma Sola's image uh, is sketch uh, from a century ago. So now uh, amateurs can basically uh, bring themselves to the cutting edge of uh, where we were a century ago. So uh, I encourage you all to, uh, to encourage people to observe and maybe observe yourself. Uh, there's a lot of actually quite important work you can do with a small telescope. Thank you.